Good evening, I'm Walter Smith Randolph, Connecticut Public's investigative editor. Welcome to tonight's Secretary of the State debate live from the Lincoln Theater on the campus of the University of Hartford. Tonight's debate is a collaboration between the League of Women Voters of Connecticut and Connecticut Public. Before I introduce the candidates, let me first go over the cumulative time format. The format is designed to allow the candidates time to discuss the issues. The only rule is that the total time used by each candidate by the conclusion of the debate must be approximately the same. The candidates will not be restricted to one or two minute responses. Instead, they may spend as little or as much time as they feel is appropriate to discuss each issue. Our goal here is to encourage debate. The candidates will take turns being the first to respond to a question. At the, at the conclusion of the question period of the debate, each candidate will make a two minute closing statement. Members of the League of Women Voters are serving as timekeepers and will keep us informed of the time used. If a serious imbalance in time use occurs, we will call it to the attention of the candidates. Applause is only permitted at the start and end of tonight's program. And now, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage Republican nominee Dominic Rapini. And, and Democratic nominee Stephanie Thomas. The first question was chosen by coin flip, and it goes to Mr. Rapini. All right, our first question, Mr. Rapini. Right now in Connecticut, you do not need to show photo identification to vote. Do you think voting in Connecticut should be more or less restrictive? So Walter, <clears throat> voter ID, and go particularly government ID, is fundamental to our, de to our democracy, is fundamental to people functioning society. I think the thought of, of us not having voter ID is, um, is, is, is ludicrous, right? I think we need, when we look at voter ID, we think of a couple things, right? We think we need, we need voter ID uh, to board an airplane, to drive a, a car. We need voter ID uh, to uh, apply for a mortgage or a, jo or a job. And you even need voter ID to kind of get the really good Mucinex behind, behind the counter at Walgreens. <clears throat> so I don't understand why it's not a no-brainer. For us, uh, 80 almost 79% of Americans say that they prefer a government ID. Mrs. Thomas. Could you repeat the question, please? The question is, right now in Connecticut, you do not need to show photo identification to vote. Do you think voting in Connecticut should be more or less restrictive? Good evening, Walter. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Um, I, definitely, uh, most people do show photo ID. Photo ID. Um, many of our registrations right now are through the DMV, so people have shown a photo ID to even register to vote. Um, I think uh, mandating government-issued ID is a solution very much in search of a problem. The incidence of people creating um, showing up at the polls with um, trying to impersonate someone else. Um, honestly, we should be so lucky with 30 to 40 percent turnout in municipal elections. It's just not the problem that exists. Instead of spending millions of dollars that it would take, um, because I know the bills that have come up in the legislature anyway has been for the state of Connecticut taxpayers to pay for that photo ID. So instead of spending those millions of dollars that way, I would rather we spend that time and money and effort on civic education that would seek to eliminate the types of mistakes that do happen at the polls and also make sure all of the um, frontline election workers are adequately trained, um, which would also eliminate some of the actual problems that we have. Um, I have spent the last several months sitting down with registrars, and when you talk to them about the problems they face, I've never heard one say, oh, it's the lack of photo ID. Thank you. Mr. Rapini, would you like to rebut? Yeah, you know, Walter, the, the job of the Secretary of State is to make sure that our elections are safe and secure and accessible. And I, I don't know why we wouldn't do everything possible to make sure that we instill, instill as much trust in our elections as possible. Uh, you know, instead of, instead of saying that, you know what, it's too hard for people to get IDs, let's bring the ID, the solution of getting identification to the people. Uh, I've been in retail my whole life, and uh, in my job at Apple, I've, you know, I've worked in a consumer group, so I know retailers, and I know that we could probably pick up, I can put together pop-up stores in uh, Connecticut retailers, 
and bring the idea of getting IDs to people uh, in, uh, in, in their, right into the community, right on the bus lines. And you know, by doing this, we help solve a lot of problems. We actually build security in our elections, but we're also helping people get the ID they need to be functional and successful in our society. Remember, 79% of all Americans want voter ID. So let's give it to them and let's do everything we can to make sure our elections are as secure as possible. And by the way, I talk to different, uh, I also talk to registrars and I hear a very different uh, perspective from them. And I'm also an election day moderator. And I know that people mostly think that they bring their ID with them. They want to show their ID. They want to prove who they are. And I think that is uh, something that we can, we can do that and we can do it better. Would you like to add anything before we move to the next sure. question? Sure. People do like to show who they are, which is why it's not a problem. Most people do present an ID when asked at the polls. The difference is it's just not required if they don't have any other ID. Um, and I would also say that, um, oh my gosh, the bright lights, I lost my train of thought, but I, um, <laughs> it's the makeup, Dom. Um, we, <laughs> sorry, I can resist. We, um, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought, but uh, I okay. apologize. We'll move on to the second question, which is uh, for you. Sure. We'll start with you, Mrs. Thomas. So do you think there are steps that need to be taken to protect the integrity of the vote in Connecticut and if so, what would those steps look like? Sure. Um, I think uh, when you talk about integrity, there's all types of issues. There's security. There's um, what voters are doing, what our professionals are doing. I think one of the very first things we can do, uh, I've been running on a platform of civic education. I think it's of critical importance to make sure that people understand how our elections work um, because that will make them less susceptible to being um, defrauded. Um, a lot of people don't know what the rules and regulations are. Um, some people don't understand when and uh, they can and can't be taken off the voting rolls, for example. I know um, I've come across people in my district who say things like, oh, I tried to save a stamp. I put me and my husband's absentee ballot in the same envelope, which of course cannot be done. So if we can educate the electorate um, how to avoid making these types of mistakes, that will help increase integrity. And then if we can make sure the workers um, have all the training they need, like many other industries um, since COVID, we had a wave of people not running for re-election, so we have a lot of new election staffers. So making sure they have the support so that, um, you know, most people don't realize on election day we have over 3,500 staff people working the polls and making sure we have a really strong baseline um, of um, efficiency, accuracy um, will really help with the integrity. And then on the other side, cybersecurity is an issue. Um, it is a threat according to Homeland Security. We now have such a prevalence of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. So making sure we take concrete steps like hiring the misinformation officer that just happened um, to make sure that um, our infrastructure uh, and um, our ecosystem, if you will, is uh, top, top line. Mr. Repeating. So there's a lot to do here in this topic of election integrity. This is, this is, a, this is an a area of elections that's near and dear to my heart, and it's, it's in my DNA, and it's my priority. So I would say this that starting with voter ID, you know, one of the biggest problems we have in Connecticut elections always, always happens with absentee ballot voting and always happens with political campaigns who kind of rig or abuse the system. Um, so for example, we, we, well, before we go into those examples, I want to make sure I would include uh, a, some sort of identifier whenever a, United, a Connecticut citizen uh, applies for their absentee ballot, whether it's a uh, social security number for people who don't have IDs or for the elderly, or it's a uh, military ID for the men and women who are serving abroad, uh, what we call OCONUS, uh, or, and, or it's just a driver's license uh, so that we have a way, something to match up with the voter records before we mail somebody a ballot, right? I think we can do a better job there, and our political campaigns have abused this. When we talk about election integrity, there's, there's many other pillars to this. There's the technology and the infrastructure of our elections, which is failing. It's been neglected for over a decade. And we have tabulators that are, that are not working properly. Uh, they're about five years past their expiration date. 
We have election software, which has been a torment of our election uh, workers uh, uh, throughout the year. And just in recent weeks, it's been, it's been down every day. It's called CVRS, and it's down every day. And when our part-time people go in, our part-time registrars, and most of them are part-time, and they go in for 10 hours a week, and they, they spend the first three hours waiting for the, the, their software to come up. These are all things that impact election integrity. What I will add to this is, when we talk about integrity, a lot of people go to the, go to the F word, right? They go to fraud. It is an issue that we have here in Connecticut. Right now, there are five cases of voter fraud in this state, right? There was just recently a conviction of a Democratic town chair on 28 counts of voter fraud, right, in the city of Stanford. We have four federal investigations right now on voter fraud uh, in this state in three of our major cities. There absolutely is a culture of fraud in our cities that we have to take care of. Because when we don't do that, then people feel that their vote does not count. And as Secretary of State, I plan to make sure that everyone's vote counts. And we have to be able to go after these people. And by the way, all these issues that we have right now all has to do with mail-in voting, absentee ballot voting, and it has to do with political campaigns abusing the system. So when my, one of my goals in election integrity is I want to get political campaigns out of the business of handing out absentee ballots and leave that responsibility up to the voters where it belongs. Ms. Thomas, would you like to go back? Whether it's photo ID, fraud, cities, what is more likely that the system we've used for many, 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 many years is not working, or is there one president who does not want to accept the results of an election? I happen to think the former. Um, when we talk about integrity, I think there's also, you know, um, Homeland Security really does say that malinformation is one of the biggest threats facing our election system right now. And what that means is tweets like I've seen from Mr. Rapini here taking a germ of truth and stretching it um, to create harm uh, and loss of faith in our election system. That's a real threat. Um, and I think it's problematic and should not exist. What we, what you're talking about, we definitely have to invest in infrastructure that has nothing to do with fraud. We definitely need to invest in education that has nothing to do with fraud. When um, our system has always had fraud, there's no such thing as a no fraud system. Um, I think about something like the US government and all the money they spend to protect our currency, yet there's a counterfeiter that will show up. So you have to make sure the penalties are in place to punish those people and that you minimize the risk to the greatest extent possible. So when you talk about the Stanford case and other cases like it, to me, that's a sign the system is working or else we wouldn't know fraud had been committed. And if you compare 28 cases of fraud five years ago, or 2017, I believe, and you think about the 1.8 million voters who vote here in Connecticut, it's what most people will call an acceptable risk. Um, I think zero fraud is naive and unrealistic. Well, I'm glad you don't work for a bank because in banks and any financial institutions, zero fraud of tolerance is, is the name of the game. Uh, as this, that's true of the business world and it should be true of our elections. So a lot to here to, un to, un uh, to unpack. So when we have, when we don't talk, when we talk about acceptable levels of fraud, you know, but we're lowering the bar, right? We're lowering the bar on what every voter expects. Every voter wants their vote to count. Every voter wants to make sure that they're not being disenfranchised by a bad actor. Every voter expects us to go after the cultural fraud in our cities. These are not binary choices. We can do all these things. And when we talk about immense information, I, this is a great, great question. I, um, we just hired a, a, a misinformation officer in, uh, in Hartford. I know that was a big thing that you, you, you uh, promoted and you signed off on that. And, um, and this is basically a minister of truth. I mean, basically what we're saying is what we've, what we've given up is our ability as voters to decide what the truth is. That's our job as engaged citizens in this democracy, in this republic. It is the job of a free and nonpartisan press to decide what the truth is. It's not up for the government to tell us what is true and what is not true. And Stephanie Thomas, she references my tweets. Well, let me tell you, I understand she wants to spend time on that because it's, it's, it's probably a welcome deflection from her own record 
uh, and, and the things where she falls short as a candidate for Secretary of State, whether it's her credentials or her experience in Connecticut elections. I have said many times that, if not once, a hundred times, that Joe Biden is our president. And I did that after I asked questions about our elections, because that is my moral responsibility and my right as a citizen to say, hey, what happened here? And that's how I learn. It's how I learn in the tech industry. And that's how I learn in elections. That's how I've become so much, I've developed such great expertise in this area. And yes, Joe Biden is our president. And, um, and so we move on from there. But we gotta remember these cases of fraud. These are real cases. And it, listen, let's, let's expand on this idea just a little bit. Would everyone agree that an elected official in Connecticut should not have committed voter fraud, and no, if, or if you commit voter fraud, you should not be elected to the hell office in the state? Well, that is certainly, that seems to be the common sense thing that I come up with, and I know many of you do agree. So for example, some of your colleagues in Hartford, Senator Jorge or George Cabrera, I think he changed his name a little bit, but make it a little harder to trace him down. He committed the fraud in Connecticut, and he's now a sitting US a state senator. Right here in Hartford, Minnie Gonzalez, state representative, one of your colleagues, committed voter fraud, and she got elected to Hartford. Now, I don't know if she's in the audience tonight, but she may be, oh, she may be working on absentee ballots right now, who knows. All right. But the next one is even more dramatic and more disturbing, is that we have, in the city of Bridgeport, which is literally the punchline of every election issue that we have, is um, the, the city clerk, who's in charge of tens of thousands of absentee ballots, Lydia Martinez, is being committed of, has committed voter fraud. I mean, I think we're talking about the, the hen watching the, uh, you know, watching the, uh, excuse me, the chicken watching the hen house. So if we're not able to, and I hope you would join me in saying that these people all should uh, resign from their position. I hope you would join me in re recognizing that these issues of fraud that I talk about are serious issues. And not look the other way, not to keep your head in the sand. Because if you do that, then you are a fraud denier. And that is unacceptable. As Secretary of State, I will identify the problems that are in front of us, and I will f take them seriously, and I will fix them, and that is our job. And if you can't identify or a problem, then you're never going to be able to fix it. Sounds like the robot. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, for sure. Um, fraud denier, I know that's what you like to tweet at me. I don't often read my tweets, but sometimes I just can't look away. Um, and uh, I feel like you're protesting a little too much. I did not bring up Joe Biden. Those are not the tweets I'm talking about. The tweets I'm talking about are the ones where you hashtag stop the steal, where you, hash, uh, you talk about patriots on January 6th doing what is right in Washington, D.C. Um, the tweets where you call me a socialist or a communist. Um, I will say that I, uh, you talk about my credentials. I have led several organizations. I've started my own business. Um, I would never conduct myself in any professional setting with that type of demeanor, and I don't think anyone wants a secretary of the state who does so. I am not political. I am for the people, and by saying that um, zero fraud is not possible doesn't mean it's something I don't work toward. As a business consultant for 25 years, I actually am hired to come in, look at problems, and solve them, and people only hire consultants when it's something they haven't been able to solve. Um, so I will stop there um, and know that I am obviously a committed professional. I uh, serve in the legislature. I didn't realize just because there were 150 other people who serve in the legislature, I'm somehow guilty by association. Um, I know in my work as a vice chair of our elections committee, I spent much of my time actually debating you when you appeared in every public hearing when you were board chair last year fight voter fraud, talking about the 5,700 and I think 35 uh, people who you called ghost voters who were dead, who voted in the 2020 Connecticut election. I believe you then went on to talk about the um, 103, I believe, cases of fraud that you found here in Connecticut, all of which proved to be untrue. Um, what I do know is that as a leader, uh, running around screaming fraud, 
one, does not instill confidence. And as someone who would be sworn to protect the system, it just feels like the wrong way to go about it. Well, there you go again, deflecting, right? And, and really, quite frankly, coming out with untruths. I, I have always asked questions about our elections. And uh, Representative Thomas, you'll remember in these testimonies, I never used the word the F word or fraud. I talked about real examples, real problems that came right from our voter rolls. This is not stuff you make up. We had 5,700 people vote on November 3rd, but they weren't registered for days, weeks, or months later. That to me is a problem. It's not about fraud. It's about fixing our system. I, we identified 104 people that showed up in the voter rolls as having voted twice. They were down there, same name, address, uh, uh, same birthday, uh, two, showing up twice, voting twice, with two different voter ID numbers. Now, it took, my, it took the SEC 14 months to actually go out and investigate them. I had to prompt them to get, they didn't want to touch it. And what, what was interesting about that case is that the, when we presented that information, we never called it fraud. We said, this is an anomaly that we need to understand. And that very next month, Representative Thomas helped, uh, helped do what I call a cover-up. She, she put in the implementer bill the, the, she withdrew the ability to look at the, for the public to see the voter IDs and to see the birth dates. So in other words, you can no longer do the search and find double voters. Well, I mean, to me, that is, that's not how you fix problems by trying to cover them up, right? We can do better. Any final, final words on, on this uh, question? Alternative facts. <laughs> okay. We're going to move on to our third question, uh, which you both have mentioned. Uh, it's a long one, though. Our current structure for supporting voting is town by town. Some towns have vastly more resources and people who are able or willing to be election workers than others. In an era where we can expect new machines, new software, and possibly new systems such as ranked choice voting and early voting, how do you propose we get all towns adequately staffed and served? This question goes to you, Mr. Pina. So Connecticut has what I believe is a phenomenal system of elections based on a decentralized model. We have 169 towns, each with a unique flavor, each with a unique way of doing, uh, taking care of their own staffing and taking care of their funding on, of Election Day. And when we look at this model, what I, and I, as an Election Day moderator, I've gotten to see this firsthand when I've worked elections. Uh, they, they really put the, our election officials are, they are the stars of this, of this state in terms of when it comes to elections. They are the rock stars. And it's because that they are detail-oriented, they, uh, they are professional, and all they want is a couple of things. They want the equipment to work, right, which it's not doing now. They want their software to work, which it's not doing right now. We're talking about infrastructure that is on, on the edge of the abyss. They want to be heard in Hartford. And they comp constantly complain about that their, their opinions did not matter, that they were not listened to. So as a Secretary of State, and as somebody who's been in business for over three decades, it's going to be my honor and privilege to get out into the field and work with uh, our election officials and treat them like customers. Because when you, anybody in business knows when you treat someone like a customer, they're going to tell you what they need. And that's how we're going to get that, that conversation started. Thomas. Definitely, um, our decentralized system presents some challenges when you're trying to do um, the same, uh, have the same quality control over all 169 towns when um, I don't think most people realize there's less than two dozen towns that have full-time registrars, the rest are part-time. So that does present some real challenges. Um, we definitely have some online training modules for people. We have uh, reciprocity with some universities to get uh, all the staff trained so that there is a good baseline. But I think we could do more. And as secretary, I feel like what we can really uh, focus on to help make sure everything is implemented um, equally, uh, two things, uh, one, uh, um, what I would call human training, right? I think what's been missing is the opportunity. Um, the secretary's office has done it in the past, and I think it's time to get back to regular convenings, Zoom or on the phone, real time, where the secretary staff can update the workers on what's happening, what's coming down the pike, but most importantly, answer real time uh, problems, uh, whatever's top of mind. Um, even registrars I know who've worked 20, 30 years say, 
like someone walks through the door, this is a high touch business and they get a question and it's something they've never dealt with before. So having some regular calls set up, having some rapid response so there's more of that human interaction because I alluded earlier to all the new registrars that are here and I think what I have heard from them is that they need some mentorship. Um, many of these offices are very small so they don't have additional people to bounce ideas off of, so that's of huge importance. And um, I think we also have to make sure we have really good training around the infrastructure pieces. So whether it's the optical sc scanners or the assisted devices um, uh, for people with disabilities, I've heard stories where someone will walk in and like the machine's not put together um, and so on. So I think there are a lot of little things we could fix that don't cost a lot of money, but do take time and attention to make sure we are more uniformly um, handling our elections. So in my career, oh, sorry, Walter, I preempted you. No, go ahead. I was going to ask you if anything to add, and clearly you yeah, do. So I clearly ahead. do. So, so, Walter, in my career, I have, in, in being able to achieve my very large goals in business, both small, medium, and large businesses, all areas where I have experience, I have been, one of my, my great roles is I've been a professional trainer in the technology field in the mid-90s. Uh, I've had to train tens of thousands of people. In my current role, I literally have to train 20,000 people a year in, in very high-tech, very complicated subjects. Not, for, not a whole lot different than you know, the, the issues and the, uh, the processes around elections. So for us to establish quality control, we do need training. And I do, under, I do appreciate the, the value of in-person training because I've, I've done it. But it is not fast enough, and it is not, it is not, it's very hard to measure. So what I will propose, and what I will ask Secretary of State will bring, is what's called a learning management system uh, to our elections. You know, the online stuff we're doing now is, I don't know, that, that, that was like, it's, it's literally, it's a decade old in terms of its effect. It's PowerPoint on steroids. We are going to do an interactive modules where the people, where our, uh, our election officials log in, they take modules, very short, compact modules in bite-sized chunks, and they get measured. They take tests, they take exams, easy stuff that they can do on their phone or they can do it on their computer. And we're going to measure them, and we'll know how they're doing in terms of attainment. We're not going to make them drive the Yukon. We're not going to make them pay $200. And, um, and we're going to look at this and say, this is really the way of the future for us to be able to train our people. And as new things happen, we'll be able to instantly have new modules to push out to people. You know, understand this. Our training, our registrar trainer of, of, uh, of voters, on average, 25% of them have not completed their certification. So whatever we're doing now is not working. And that will be a priority for me to make that happen. And quite frankly, when you want quality control, you know what it requires? Leadership. It also requires great communications from the Secretary of State's office. Right now, they, they get very sketchy one word, two word answers. Last fall, people remember with the, uh, in the municipal elections, they got the wrong interpretation of a statute of, regarding how you sign the assistance of an absentee ballot that affected thousands of our ballots. And I'm sorry, this is not fake news. This is the real things that happen. They're all chronicled in the SEC uh, um, uh, documents. But the point is leadership, good communication, and a 21st century learning system called a learning management system, or LMS. And if I could add, um, I love LMS systems. I think they work best when, um, I think for like an entry level uh, registrar, when there is very discrete, specific information, LMS is great. Um, but I don't know that this is the time to invest money in such a system when the secretary's office has been routinely under-resourced, if I could redeploy that money, I would rather hire additional staff so that when people do call in, they're not getting one-word answers by an overburdened staff. Um, I think the problem with LMS and the registrar's job, or even this portion of the town clerk's job, is that every question is very different because you're dealing with humans who come in with um, problems that you know you won't see it exactly the same way. There are, of course, some common questions. So LMS is part of the solution, but I don't think it's the whole solution. Well, it's a solution in Silicon Valley where we train on the most complicated 
up-to-date subjects and uh, that are known to man. So I think if we, if we can do it in Silicon Valley, we can do it here in Connecticut. And we don't replace the, uh, the customer service um, uh, aspect of it. We just make sure we have whoever answers that phone knows what the hell they're doing. And that's, not something, that's something that we lack right now. So LMS systems are absolutely the way to go. And, and this is the way I, I'm able to train thousands of people on very complex subjects. And it will work here in Connecticut. That's, uh, that is, uh, that's something I'll guarantee you. And by the way, we talk about the cost. Yeah, cost is always an issue. But you know, election infrastructure, election infrastructure is infrastructure no different than roads and bridges. We, we will invest the money we need to make sure our bridges and roads are going. And our elections are so important that we've got to find a way to invest. Even if I have to find private funding from the private sector to help some of these initiatives, initiatives get out the door. Anything to add? No, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our next question, and this question will start with uh, Mrs. Thomas. Uh, part of the role of the Secretary of the State is managing business services. How do you plan on attracting more business in Connecticut? Sure. Um, you know, the Secretary's role manages the business services, so when people are registering, filing their annual reports, um, interacting with the MyConnect system, I'm a small business owner. Um, um, I, uh, let's see, I had my first management job when I was 16. I worked my way up from intern to president of a company. I started my own company from scratch with $1,000 in capital and grew it within um, two years to over $2 million and up. I raised $20 million annually for nonprofits. I do think I have a little bit of business experience, but, um, with the secretary's office, where I think there's great room for um, proactive improvement, is being uh, a, a real partner to the business community. As a legislator, for example, when new programs, new uh, trainings, new resources became available, I would push out emails to the businesses in my district, and many people have stopped me to say how helpful that is, because I know when you're running a business, and you know, 90-something percent of our businesses in Connecticut are small businesses, and when you're doing that every day, you don't have time to seek out all the resources. So we know what industries businesses are in. We often know if they're minority-owned, woman-owned, veteran-owned. So we could play a much stronger role in getting information out to them that could help them. Um, and I think that is just one thing that would make us feel more business-friendly. Um, I know the Secretary's office currently is actually looking at our fee structure, and that would be something that I would certainly seek to make sure that we are competitive with uh, nearby states in particular. Um, and I've also been traveling around talking um, to business owners as individuals, but also chambers of commerce, and trying to figure out ways that um, the secretary's office could be additive without stepping on anyone's toes. And one thing that came up in one of those brainstorming sessions was um, businesses all over the state um, many, like I belong to my chamber in Norwalk, and um, you know, there's another chamber in Westport next door, there's another uh, in Wilton, et cetera, and I don't always know what each one is doing. Um, so we talked about having the secretary mobilize a site, like something like, using something like Mobilize, an app, so that chambers can upload their events, so business owners have a one-stop shop where they can see what is happening around the state and take advantage of that. Um, and th there's more that can be done, but as a business owner, I very much am committed to making sure that community is listened to, uh, just like voters and election workers. So I'm not afraid to step on toes, right. and I have, I have over the, the last three decades in business, I've been in both, I've had both small business, I've worked in retail, I've, um, I've managed change of stores, I've managed storefronts, and I, I have been my, I have even been the uh, a vice president of manufacturing here in Connecticut of, of a tech firm. Uh, I've signed in front of the paycheck, and now I work with I work with large, large U.S. retailers around the country, including the U.S. military. And so when I come into this office as Secretary of State, I will bring a lot of credibility and a scope of experience that's really hard to match. 
Uh, I can talk, I can, I, I have a scalable uh, personality. I can talk for, to a store manager or a sales associate and, and two minutes later be working with a CEO. And that skill set is invaluable in being able to go out into the community. We need to reimagine the role of Secretary of State. And yeah, I might step on some toes in doing so. But we, the primary thing that we have to do, that I want to do is, is back to a, a, techno, a technology solution. We need data, right? We need data on our businesses. We need to know what businesses are coming in, and we need to know why our businesses are failing. We're not doing a forensic audit of, the, of these companies as they exit Connecticut or as they go out of business, whether they're crushed during the mandates of COVID or they just find, find it an uncompetitive environment or they can't get labor. We gotta build a database of all that information so that when companies are looking to from, hopefully to come from outside Connecticut uh, here uh, and, and move into our state, they know that there'll be one more champion for them. And they, they need the data they know to understand where their markets are gonna be. If you're an aerospace company, there's no way to find out who's making ball bearings in Connecticut, right? Only maybe you can use, punch in some SIC codes and get close to it. But we need a more robust set of data like we've seen in other states, a business-to-business -business marketing tool, which will be something that I will be my pleasure to bring to the people. And to our business, uh, to the business community out there, I promise you we will not treat you like an ATM, but we're going to treat you like a business partner. I'm going to treat you like a customer all day long because you are bringing revenue to the state and you deserve the best service that you can get from your state, whether it's for me or my other com uh, colleagues up in Hartford. I would just add that um, a lot of that work is done by a combination of partners, Department of Labor, Office of Workforce Strategy, Department of Economic and Community Development. So some of that would not be within the lane of the Secretary's Office, but we it sounds like we share uh, the idea that we have to be good partners to businesses, as I said, and I stand by that. Well, as I said, we are going to reimagine the role of the Secretary of State. That, right, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, and this one, we'll start with you, Mr. Rapini. Uh, what is your position on ranked choice voting, and what do you think is the role of the Secretary of the State is in relation to this method of voting? Well, the second part of that question is, is self-evident. But here's, we gotta take a, we, I've studied ranked choice voting and I've looked at it for some time to try to understand it. I'm always interested in, in anything that might be an innovation. But in the final analysis, ranked choice voting is just a Ponzi scheme. It is designed by election reformers to help marginal candidates to get, in, get onto a ticket and get votes that they normally would not earn. You know, when you're running a campaign, you're a candidate, you spend a year, if, if, if not longer, you know, raising money, building support, spreading, testing your messages. In ranked choice voting, you can short circuit all that. And then when you, then you have an election where, you know, everybody, everybody gets a vote. I mean, it's kind of like in Little League when everybody gets a trophy. You know, our system of government, which, is, which, has, which has withstood the, the uh, test of time for a couple of hundred, for a couple of centuries now, is based on the very basic principle that every voter gets one vote, not many votes. And if you don't believe me, you know, look to people who've tried before, like Jerry Brown, the governor of California, who, who vetoed a, an expansion of, uh, of uh, in 2016 of uh, ranked choice voting, saying, hey, this is too complicated. Um, this is not, you know, people are, are, are not gonna get a mandate, they're not gonna understand it. And then we look at what happened in the New York primary just um, uh, uh, two years back uh, in the primary for uh, Eric Adams. And that was so complicated, it took them three weeks to do the calculations for ranked choice voting. Then uh, what happened is most people stopped, they didn't put in other votes for the other 10 candidates or the other eight candidates. And so towards the final rounds, 140,000 voters in New York City had their ballots thrown out. That's, that's something called ballot exhaustion, right? They were disenfranchised because they didn't play the game, they didn't understand the game. We saw the same thing in Alaska. They didn't get their election, their results till the end of August. 11,000 voters had their ca votes cast out. I would say that here in Connecticut, we get enough problems with our elections without having to introduce a system of elections that requires a user manual. So my answer is no to ranked choice voting. Thomas. Um, I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. Um, I think many people love it as an alternative. I think most people know it's Although it's only used in two states in completion, it's used in many jurisdictions around the country. 
Um, and people find it uh, a very palatable way to avoid what they call holding their nose and voting between uh, you know, the lesser of two evils. But um, whether it's right for Connecticut now, um, I have been on the record many times saying, I don't think so. It's just not one of our top priorities. I know the governor recently said he would be looking into it. Um, we have some real challenges here in Connecticut in part because of this decentralized system that we spoke about earlier. Um, but we also have um, equipment that is old, um, over 20 years old, um, that uh, we could not use for ranked choice voting. We will be purchasing new equipment um, under the next secretary, so it could be implemented, but that's gonna be a few years off. But what concerns me is that ranked choice voting is often treated as a panacea for um, uh, people sort of assume that because you have ranked choice voting, uh, minor party candidates, other candidates who might not typically have a fair shot, have a better shot. Um, and given Connecticut's system, I'm not sure that's true. We have this town committee system, which uh, really works with both parties. We have different rules for getting on the ballot for minor party candidates. We have different grant amounts under some circumstances for the citizens election program. So all of those things um, might still make it difficult to um, have the same type of voice uh, as in ranked choice voting won't solve that. So I think it's something nice to look into, think about. I have always said the same thing. Any policy works best from the ground up rather from the legislature down. So if people are interested in ranked choice voting, I encourage them to look into it, learn more about it, and then eventually, if enough people think it's of interest, then we can start studying it seriously. So if the goal, if the goal is to get more ballot access, you, we, let's look at this current election here in 2022. We have a, the SAM party, we have the Independent Party, the Libertarian Party. Other, we have the Working Families Party, that's one of your favorites. And, um, and these guys are on, these, everybody is getting on this ballot. Now, that said, probably Connecticut is probably the third hard, hardest state in the, in the United States to get ballot access. There are things we can do. I would like to improve that access, because I, I think the more the merrier, right? But I don't think everyone, I, I think a lot of people deserve to get on the ballot. I just don't think they all deserve a vote. Right, and that's the difference between ranked choice voting and our current system of elections, which is working. You know, it, what strikes me is probably what is missing here in this conversation is a, is a major advocate of ranked choice voting is Cynthia Jennings from the Independent Party. I, I'm not sure why she's not here. Um, I know that Robert Hodling was on the uh, on the stage with um, Stefanowski and Lamont, and it, listen, I don't agree with her on the topic, but I I, I respect all opinions. I love to hear what she says about ranked choice voting, but we're not gonna be able to hear that tonight. Uh, she's a social justice warrior. Um, she's passionate. I've met her and she's, I think she's a very interesting candidate for us. And if uh, a lot of you folks out there, if you, you know, if you like, if you like uh, Representative Thomas, you probably like Cynthia Jennings too. You should take a look at her as well. I find that a little insulting since she's an African American woman. I'm not sure what else we have in common other than that, but I will stop there. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I certainly think she's a candidate for Secretary of State. That's what she has in common with us. Right? And uh, if you want to go in, into anything else beyond that, beyond that and, and play a race card, God bless you. But I'm not going to play ball with that. You, I think all you, the candidates you, for Secretary of State said, should be up here. You said me, not us, um, which is why I took offense. Well, I, you know, I think she has. Uh, you guys have a lot of passion together. So I think you guys, people need to take a look. Take, take a look at her. Take a look at me. Take a look at uh, Representative Thomas. Any final thoughts before we move to the next question? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this question is, uh, we're going to start with you, Mrs. Thomas. Uh, on the ballot this year is a question about allowing the General Assembly to provide for early voting in the state. What is your stance on this ballot question, and what would, would early voting look like in your administration? Sure. Um, obviously, as Vice Chair of the Elections Committee, I was supportive of this measure. I'm a big fan of early voting in that... Um, you know, people often talk about the need for early voting as being, I don't know, somehow there's, it, it, it always seems like it's good for people of a low socioeconomic status or people of color, and yes, that's true, but early voting um, based on 
every person I've talked to, the people who came to testify and supported the bill over the many years, it's good for everybody. It's good for seniors or any community who doesn't know their good days from their bad days. I've met men with arthritic knees and uh, elderly gentlemen who said, I'm so angry I couldn't make it out to vote once. I woke up that day and my knee pain was so great I couldn't get out of bed. If he had a couple of days to choose from, he could have voted. It's good for, um, I've talked to mothers with young children who say, oh, my little one work, woke up um, and I couldn't bundle them to get them out of the house. They were too sick. They had to stay in bed and there was no one else uh, to uh, watch them. It's good for people with unreliable transportation. I talk to a lot of young people who are like, my car breaks down a lot. It's good for people who take public transportation. It's good for everybody. So I am a passionate supporter. Where I think I differ from uh, Mr. Rapini here is he thinks the complication to implement it makes it not worth having. Um, I believe that is a challenge that um, almost every other state in our country and all of the U.S. territories have managed to tackle. Connecticut is one of only four states that does not have some early voting, uh, and we're talking about early in-person voting. Um, so we do have challenges because of our 169 town structure. We do have to make sure that whatever the legislature decides to do, that we attach the funding so that these costs don't get pushed down to individual towns. We have to make sure that what that policy looks like could actually be implemented across um, the state. Um, I have been looking at models. I know the secretary's office is also looking at models. There were studies done in the past. So we have all the data we need. Um, I, 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 I'm still looking at models, but my recommendation would definitely fall somewhere between two days and five days. Um, and I, I'm still working on what that will exactly look like, but I will be ready to introduce legislation in January. So when I look at a problem, and I, particularly when I look at issues, problems here in Connecticut or, or possible solutions in Connecticut, I look to solve problems that are unique to Connecticut. Yeah, maybe there's, there's 46 days of uh, early, 46 days doing early voting, but there's no Western democracy doing it, right? All, so they're all hand counting their ballots all in one day like France. So. You know, if you want to keep up with the Joneses, God bless you, that's fine. But we have to solve problems right, that are important for Connecticut. And when we look at the Connecticut structure, our strength is the decentralized uh, voting system and the, and the election officials that we have now, which are mostly part-time. So when we look at early voting, we look at, we look at a, a referendum that, quite frankly, is written like a blank check. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know if it's going to be three days, five days. We don't know if it's going to be 45 days. We don't know because the lawmakers who are going to decide that haven't even been elected yet, right? And, and I don't know about you guys, but I don't, sign a, I don't sign a check unless I know the dollar amount on it. That's just irresponsible in the business world and, and irresponsible for each and every one of us personally. So let's, let's take another look at this. If we had 30 days of early voting, all right, um, if we had to have one precinct in every one of 169 towns for 30 days, that, I estimate, will be between 15 and $20 million of unfunded mandate for the state of Connecticut. We're all worried about costs and we're worried about investments, and, and I've talked to you, I'd love to invest in elections. But you know what? This is not where I want to put our money, right? And that's where, I, and our cities and towns don't have that money to do that. They've got enough issues as it is. The second thing we look at, okay, what problem are we solving? Well, Connecticut has one of the highest voter turnouts in the country. I mean, it's unbelievable. We just do a great job with our election officials in the, in the towns and cities. We have a higher voter turnout than the cities that have, the states that have early voting, like Georgia and Pennsylvania, California. We have a higher voter turnout than the national average. So we ask ourselves, what problem are we solving? And this is critical. We need to understand that. And then, most importantly, we got to look at the labor, right? You take a part-time workforce, right, compared to the full-time the full-time election officials in all those other states and the county-based government, 
And we're talking about, you know, moms and dads who are working 10 hours a week uh, as election officials. And all of a sudden, they got to work 30 days. You know, they normally, their normal life is, take, is watching their grandchildren or they have a full-time job. And we're going to crush this workforce, right, and create chaos across the state. And we're going to lose valuable talent in this, if, we, um, if we don't get control of this. So for all these reasons, I do not think early voting is right for Connecticut. Now understand, my job is to tell you what you need to hear. That's what I do in business, that's how, that's what, how I'll conduct myself as Secretary of State. I don't want to tell you what you want to hear, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. If, we, if the voters decide on this, um, on this uh, referendum, then you know what? I will do the best job I can, and I will deliver the best voting experience that Connecticut can have, given those situations, and I will fight for three or less days. Thank you. I wouldn't characterize this as a blank check. It's actually the lawmaking process. Our constitution would need to be changed to allow for early voting. Until it's changed, we don't know what the legislature would decide to do. Um, no, I've, I've never heard anyone <laughs> at any table in Connecticut talking about 30 days because it's just not feasible. The longest period I've heard anyone say is seven days. Um, Secretary Merrill, when she was in the role, um, I believe in 2017 or 2019, when she made a recommendation, it was three days. Um, so when we talk about this cost in 30 days, that's an unrealistic scenario that would never happen. Um, and when the legislature decides to hear it, should the ballot referendum pass, I hope Mr. Rupini will show up to testify for what he thinks it should look like. As far as highest turnout, um, you know, the U.S. in I'm sorry, Connecticut in 2020, I think we ranked number 20 or number 19 in terms of turnout. But when we look at municipal elections, we're routinely between 30 and 40 percent turnout. So when you talk about zero tolerance for uh, so-called fraud, I talk about um, zero tolerance for doing anything that would depress turnout. I would love to live in a society with 100 percent turnout. Um, so early voting is good for all the populations I've talked about and more. Um, it is routinely supported by people. What I found in 2020, which I thought was interesting when I was out door knocking, so many people read the national news. They thought we had early voting here in Connecticut, and they were shocked to find out that we are so restrictive. Um, there, I remember in the public hearing, there was a woman from Texas, and Texas, incidentally, was the first state to adopt early voting um, in the 1980s. And she said, what? There's something we have in Texas that you don't even have and allow in Connecticut? I think people are shocked. Um, and I hope they'll be voting yes on the ballot referendum. And I think it would be good for everybody. Yeah, so Texas has other things we don't have. Full-time election officials and county-based elections, right? And the key phrase in this, re in this rebuttal was, we do not know. And I, I will not sign up for anything where I do not know the parameters before I sign it. It is very, it is that simple. We would be better off with all the problems we have with mail-in voting. We would be better off putting more rigor and and uh, and, uh, and conditions around uh, mail-in voting than we would be with early voting because it's just not right for Connecticut. We're not built. We don't have the infrastructure. So actually, I just want to confirm. So then you're saying you support instituting no excuse absentee ballots? Because I, I, you've said I, the So opposite. what I'm saying yeah. is, yeah, if, if given my conditions and the parameters that I would outline, if, if, if the lawmakers would agree to that, then I would, I, would approve, I would accept some of that. I would let that happen because it's way better than early voting. And I can actually put more controls over mail-in voting and absentee ballot voting based on what I've learned in the last three years. I can put more rigor on that and I can keep it much more secure than we have today. The only issue when I, I talk to a lot of people who actually like to go in person at the polls. So yeah. no excuse, okay. absentee ballot, it's not the same for them. And again, I don't wanna do anything that uh, depresses turnout. Um, and I think we can do it um, cheaply, fairly. We don't need county government, not every state. Um, uses that county system. I'm good. 
Well, great. We're going to move on to our, our next question, uh, and we'll start with you on this one, uh, Mr. Rapini. Uh, the last time we upgraded voting machines was nearly 20 years ago, thanks to federal funds. What's your plan to upgrade voting machines, and where would the money come from? So, as I as I've described, is our our elections and the the essential equipment, which is core to our elections, is our tabulators. I. My plan is to make sure that we have the next generation of tabulators that are based on paper, which has an incredible audit trail. I've seen the processes on election day and I think that is fantastic and I want to continue that. I want machines, tabulators that can, are not connected to the internet because I think there's no reason for them to be. And, that, and I think they're, they're also easier to maintain. So that is the, the plan is the tabula take this, these tabulators which are already five years past their expiration date. I mean, I think 118 of them uh, are in, out of service right now, coming out of the primary. And, um, and there's really no reason for that. We need a technology plan so that the day we bring in the new tabulators, we already have a plan to replace them. These things have to be done concurrently. The, money's get, the money, I, think, I believe the taxpayers of Connecticut have to pay for that so that we, um, well, we have an even distribution of these new machines. I would consider private partner partnerships for that, but I think the, the, the lawmakers owe it to Connecticut to make that happen. I tell you where we could have gotten some money. Uh, in 2020, we spent almost $7 million sending out absentee ballot applications uh, to everybody in Connecticut who was a registered voter. Or it was, and, and what happened was these absentee ballot applications were freely downloadable off the internet. I mean, if we don't waste our money, we can actually find the, the funds to do this stuff. And, um, and of course, we had 200,000 of these ballots come back as undeliverable. So. We, we have to make sure that we do make the right decisions. Um, uh, most of that money, I think 5.4 million was CARES Act and some of the other was limited in usage, so we wouldn't have been able to use it that way anyway. Um, uh, I'll stop there. Okay, we'll move on to our next question, which will be our last question uh, for the evening, and we will start with you, uh, Mrs. Thomas. So what ideas do you have to protect voter information and voter privacy? Protect voter information and voter privacy. I'm not sure I 100% understand that question. Um, you know, people are entitled to have privacy. Um, actually, one thing that jumps out at me, and I think it's really important to bring up, because I've been speaking with a lot of people with disabilities and some of the challenges they face with voting, um, and some of them have to do with obstructions and sidewalks and lack of curb cuts and that type of thing. But one issue they talk about a lot is um, uh, how many of the people at the polls um, restrict their right to independence and privacy in voting. They're trying to be helpful, but they offer to help them fill out the ballot. Um, they don't always have a sleeve. Um, and it's something that I think we uh, in the secretary's office can really do a lot more to make sure voting is more accessible. And that just occurred to me and I have time, so I thought I'd talk about it. Um, in terms of uh, voter information, um, Mr. Rapini did allude to something earlier, which is our um, central voter registration uh, system, which goes down, it's glitchy. Uh, the secretary's office is in the process of rolling out uh, a new new version, um, which we definitely need to implement um, very as soon as we can, because that is a big issue. We, um, uh, as most people know, with uh, federal legislation, there's a lot of, uh, Mr. Rapini just talked about 200,000 return applications. We routinely have to send out about 175,000 notices a year um, to make sure we know if someone um, is valid to vote, like a change of address or something changed. Um, so we, we definitely have to make sure we have um, the system that can take in all that information when we have a part-time staff that it, we can't have them losing work days because the system is down. Uh, I'll stop there. So <clears throat> voter privacy and voter information, protecting that data starts with cybersecurity. Right? Here in Connecticut, we have 169 points of vulnerabilities and I'm not saying we have a problem. I'm just saying that's, that's the reality of cybersecurity. We have to make sure that we are doing everything to make sure our cyber programs are strong and secure. 
whether it's limiting devices or having uh, state-of-the-art privileges for logging in. The challenge I have with understanding what our cybersecurity state is right now is that we haven't had an update in that program since 2018. I mean, I'm sure they've been doing work. I know, I know there's good people there. But since 2018, there's been no update, no transparency on what we're doing to advance voter security and uh, cybersecurity. And when we talk about cybersecurity, we're not talking about affecting the people's votes. We're talking about the voter rolls, right? We're talking about access to the CVRS system, which is, I know they're in the process of doing that, but I think they've been in that process for two or more years and have failed to really achieve the goals that they need to achieve to make that system robust and reliable. So cybersecurity has to be uh, it really in the, in the DNA of everyone uh, who touches our elections, and that will be certainly one of my priorities. We have to make sure that we're, we're, we're stress testing the system with the, uh, the National Guard because they have, they have resources, but I also want to bring in private sector uh, companies that can really push us hard to make sure that and help us identify any openings or, or losses there. So cybersecurity, I think, is really where we're going to be able to spend those resources and apply them and inspect what we expect. Um, yeah, since you mentioned cybersecurity, obviously hugely important. We, um, as you say, with the 169 towns, um, you know, there's ransoms, uh, phishing, all of those, making sure we're educating that workforce how to avoid some of those threats. Um, I think we need uh, a risk assessment done in every one of our 169 towns because frankly, they're all different. We, um, uh, I think we need to look at uh, uh, chain of custody a little more closely now. Um, we definitely have two people required for some things in our cybersecurity system, but not for everything. And I think we just have to tighten up those details. Um, obviously, I have said it once, I'll say it again, we have to focus on voter education. Um, there are so many uh, threats and, and also uh, uh, election worker education because many of these threats can be mitigated if people actually know what's happening, what to do, what not to do. Um, and lastly, I definitely have already been making some um, outreach to secretaries of the state around the country. I would very much uh, be active with the National Association of Secretaries of the State. Um, Secretary Merrill, I know, sat on the cybersecurity um, subcommittee um, and the uh, cybersecurity uh, CISA, um, infrastructure security agency, they offer many trainings. Um, whenever I've led a group, I've always gotten involved and served on committees, um, and I would definitely be working to make sure Connecticut is best in class across the board for everything we do. Thank you. Well, we, when it comes to cybersecurity, we don't have a lot of time for on-the-job training. It's something that we got to tackle on day one. Uh, one of the first appointees I will have in the Secretary of State's office will be a Chief Technology Officer somebody that will oversee all the technology projects that I, uh, that I will bring on board, including the responsibility for cybersecurity. Stress testing needs to happen at least twice a year, once from the National Guard and once from a private source, so that we have a completely different approach to each, to, uh, to each um, stress test. That's, that's where we stand. Final response before we move on to closing statements? I know, it's fine. Okay, uh, we're now gonna move on to our closing statements. Uh, you both have two minutes uh, in your closing statement. And um, Mr. Rapini, since you won the coin toss, you will go first, so your closing statement. All right, so election integrity is, is my priority. It's in my DNA and it will be in the DNA of everyone that touches the Connecticut election system. There are three pillars to election integrity. One is it requires reliable, accurate technology. We've had over a decade of neglect of our, of our technology infrastructure our, our machines are failing. Our software is on the edge of the abyss, being used in emulation on a, on a browser it wasn't designed for. And there are so many more things that we can do to make sure that uh, we get this stuff under control. I will fix our technology. I will modernize it and bring it into the 21st century. Election integrity also requires leadership and communication. We've had legendary failures coming out of the office in Hartford, whether it's bad guidance or misinterpretation of statues. This, this office has to be clear and crisp on its communications so that our election officials have the proper marching orders and they know how to get, go about getting their job done and doing it right. They want to do the right job, but they also need good, good communication. 
I will bring the best practices from the business world to make that happen. And accountability. There is a culture of fraud and corruption in our cities. I will eliminate the root causes and bring trust back to our elections because that's really the name of the game. It is vital to our republic that we do everything in our power to ensure the safety, security, and accessibility of our elections. And I'm the only candidate that has over three decades of technology experience, three decades of business experience, and I've rolled up my sleeves and done the hard work to understand Connecticut elections, whether it's the data or just becoming an election day moderator and understanding what the realities are on election day. My vision for Connecticut elections revolves around innovation, leadership, and accountability. My pledge is that I will bring to bear a lifetime of experiences to this office. I will govern without ideology. And I, will leave, I will govern in a nonpartisan manner. I will leave the R next to my name uh, at the door. And when I'm Secretary of State, I will roll up my sleeves and I will get the job done. I am poised to do my best work. On November 8th, That's your time. I, I ask that you guys That's your time. consider voting for Don McRapini for Secretary of State. Thank you and Godspeed. Okay, we're going to reset the clock here. All right, and it's Thomas. Here's what I know for sure. Connecticut does not need misinformation and extremist rhetoric. It needs help to avoid sinking into the division that is being sowed around the nation. You don't have to do a lot of research to see that only one of us represents that path. On December 17th, 2020, Mr. Rapini, citing a Newsmax story by Donald Trump, tweeted, we have reports of illegal immigrants voting in Connecticut. He likes to tweet insults at me and others. On January 6, 2021, Mr. Rapini tweeted, Patriots by the thousands in D.C. fighting for what is right. My mentor used to say, I never buy when I'm being sold. We don't need a salesman. We need a balanced problem solver, a manager, and a demonstrated leader. Whether you're a Democrat, Working Families Party, Republican, unaffiliated, independent, Green Party, or any other party, I hope to earn your support. Whether you're female, male, non-binary, speak English as a second language, whether you're a young person or silver-haired, an atheist or devout, differently abled or neurotypical, whether you have a PhD or no degree, I hope to earn your support. It doesn't matter to me if your issue is protecting abortion or preventing abortion. You have a right in our representative form of democracy to express those opinions, and it all starts at the ballot box. I hope to receive your support on November 8th so that I can, in turn, support you by protecting this most important right. Please see my website if you'd like additional information about my platform, vote stephaniethomas.com. Stephanie with a PH, thank you. Thank you, candidates, and thank you for watching Connecticut Public and the League of Women Voters of Connecticut's debate series. Don't change the channel just yet. Connecticut Public's Frankie Graziano is standing by with your post-debate coverage. Our next debate will take place this Thursday between the candidates for Connecticut's 5th Congressional District, Republican George Logan and Democrat Johanna Hayes. The debate will be hosted by Connecticut Public's Frankie Graziano, live from the campus of Central Connecticut State University. If you have a question you'd like to ask those candidates, head to ctpublic.org. Last vote. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. Have a great evening.